Hey everybody and welcome to another JASP tutorial. In this tutorial uh, I'm going to be running JASP uh, 0.13.1 uh, which at the time of recording is the most recent uh, update to the program but as always as they say in their disclaimer here this is a preview release and a number of features are still missing. In this episode, I want to go ahead and play around with um, a little bit of a factor analysis. Uh, so this is a tutorial on how to do a exploratory factor analysis, an EFA. Okay, so here's some data that I have for you. Um, this is some early data that me and my um, collaborator have collected. So this is real data. But it's early data, so some it, it appears in some form in a, in a forthcoming paper uh, that's due out hopefully before the election because it has a lot to do with politics and political ideology. So we'll see if that happens. So we have this data set open, and you can see that um, it's a simple Likert scale, one to five, um, agree, uh, strongly disagree, too strongly agree, one to five, respectively. So... Um, and I have uh, 15 of these uh, 15 of these scale items. And so what I want to do is I want to do an exploratory factor analysis. I want to see if these 15 items can be uh, shrunk down into a number of, of factors. And of course we're gonna we're going to hopefully get fewer than 15 factors because we don't want <laughs> we want to see some correlations between these uh, items on um, a much smaller number of factors so we're going to click on exploratory factor analysis and that's going to bring up the EFA dialog and this is where we're going to choose everything and then as you can see as always our exploratory factor analysis results tab will open and um, the default tables are ready for uh, putting in information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually choose all 15. So I'm going to hold shift, click on the first one, hold shift, and click on the last one so it collects all of them. And then I am going to bring that entire group. Oh, silly me. I know why that it didn't work because um, it can only get scales. So I actually need to go edit these variables as they come in. So I need to um, click on them and change them all to scales and I will do a quick cut so you don't need to worry about any of that. Okay, now that we got that all handled, uh, this, icon, this icon here tells you what kind of variables are allowed to go in there. So just a, a reminder on that one. So we can then click on 1 and hold shift and click on 15 to grab the entire list, bring that over, and there we go. Now it's going to um, already try to do the factor analysis, so I don't want to focus on this yet. So let's talk about these options before we get into the results. Uh, so we have to choose first how we're going to handle between one of these three radio buttons, how we're going to handle um, creating the factors. Uh, and this is remember this is an exploratory factor analysis. So parallel analysis is factors are selected on the base basis of doing a parallel analysis. So with this method, factors are selected when their eigenvalue is bigger than the parallel average random eigenvalue. Okay, that's a lot of big stuff, and I'm not going to go ahead and define those in this video, but um, generally speaking, it's by default, and it, it generally speaking, is fine to leave it as default. As an exploratory factor analysis, you may not have an idea of how many factors your items will have, and so doing parallel analysis is okay. Eigenvalues, on the other hand... Um, is how you would choose factors based on an eigenvalue. Um, a lot of the times, eigenvalues over 1 are used to create factors. But you can see that I only have, when I change it to 1, I only have one factor. because I, And, and we'll, we'll look at some um, output options that will help us figure that out. But um, 1 is, generally speaking, where where people draw the line, so to speak, 
in uh, eigenvalues. So again, if you don't know, you could use that one. Or if you had some idea that I have three different factors, uh, and so my my uh, theory suggests that uh, I should have three factors. I design these items to um, follow three different constructs. And so if I put in manual and then three factors, you can see that the loadings then, um, these factor loadings, then uh, conform to a three factor model. Now, that would, uh, you can see that doing all three of these changes how many factors I have. And so choosing the number of factors is pretty important to have some theory behind why you're choosing that for your EFA, okay? Estimation method, you can do minimum residual, maximum likelihood, principal axis, axis factoring, and uh, these will have, and, and so on and so forth. Minimum residual, maximum likelihood is generally speaking uh, what uh, most programs default to. I'm not entirely sure why minimum residual is the default here, but maximum likelihood is uh, the estimation method here. And, and you can see that minimum residual doesn't really change versus maximum likelihood, um, the the chi-square value is not really changing all that much. My loadings don't really change. They don't get reshuffled. You can see that my, my factors didn't. I'm going to leave it on manual for the rest of this tutorial because this is what we had set up our um, these Biff Yachts thing, these 15 items. We had set it up as three different factors, so I'm going to go ahead and show you the rest of those. Now over here is we have uh, rotation, we have orthogonal or oblique. Orthogonal rotation is when you have fact when you when you think you have factors that are um, orthogonal to each other, so they they are perpendicular to each other. And so if you you change that, uh, you can do different uh, kinds of orthogonal rotations: Veramax, Quartermax, Bentler T, Equimax, and Geomin T. Uh, Veramax, I think, generally speaking, um, one of the more uh, common orthogonal rotations. Um, and so orthogonal rotation is if you know your factors are um, not correlated at all, to put it into brief terms. Oblique, on the other hand, is a rotation that is uh, due to there is some correlations between the factors that you're going to be creating. And so they're going to share some variance. And so that's why you would do an oblique rotation. And you have Promax, Oblomin, Simplomax, Bentler Q, Cluster, and Geomin Q. And I believe Promax and Oblomin are the ones that are, generally speaking, most common. Um, and so I'm just going to leave it on Promax. I don't remember exactly what we did when we first looked at this. And then um, you can get your correlation matrix or a covariance matrix on this. Um, you can determine how the analysis continues. And your output options. So we get a chi-square test table, we get a factor loading table, and we get a factor characteristics table. We can get further character, uh, further tables if we want. We can get the structure matrix. We can get the factor correlations, and we can get the additional fit indices, um, which uh, loads up here. So these are the factor characteristics. So we if, characteristics, excuse me. So we get our three factors here because that's what was created. That's what I've left over here. And so we get the correlations among the three. And you can see that these are fairly high correlations. And so that's why doing an oblique is important. In, uh, an oblique rotation is important in this case. Um, and then we get the uh, other things. And then we get the additional fit indices, which is kind of important if you were doing, more important if you were doing a confirmatory factor analysis and not really useful in an exploratory factor analysis because an exploratory factor analysis should lead to a confirmatory factor analysis or a structural equation model. You shouldn't leave um, a scale validation uh, process as an EFA. You should collect more data and do a CFA. Uh, so we have the RMSEA, and um, we get the TLI and the BIC. These are all f um, how good our model fits with, or how good our data fit with the model that we're trying to create here. So with three factors, how good is the model fit here? And um, 
pretty sure these aren't that great. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember what exactly is the case there. Um, moving on to highlight over here. So I want to scroll back up to factor loading. So you can see that some of the, these, these factors are, aren't actually up, appearing here. So uh, just because 1 through 6 appears to um, have only loadings in factor 1, well, it technically has values in factor 2 and factor 3. These factor loadings exist here, but our highlight is only showing us anything over 0.4, which is a conventional number for cutoffs. I can lower this, and you, you'll you see that in the um, structure matrix here that uh, more appear. And as I bring it m lower and lower and lower, they will appear in, and I can bring it all the way down with no cutoffs, and it'll give me the full factor loadings. But of course, we want some cutoffs, and so we're looking at like essentially correlations with the factor itself. This individual item correlates with factor 1 at 0.62 is essentially how you read that. And um, 0.4 is a good cutoff mark. Uh, some people do 0.35. It doesn't really change. Ooh, let me get there. 0.35. You can see that it doesn't really change that. So we'll leave it at point, f And then you can, you can see that if we increase our cutoff, uh, fewer items match. So we're going to leave uh, it at 0.4, and I really like this scroll bar with it. That's pretty cool. But you can also type in your number there. All right, we can get some assumption checks if we want to. We can get the AMO test and the Bartlett's, Bartlett's test. I'm, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what the, either of those do. Um, so, you know, there you go. Um, Bartlett's test seems to be uh, significant at the less than 0 0.001 level, so I'm not entirely sure what we do with that information you can exclude uh cases pairwise or listwise so uh excluding cases pairwise if an observ if one observation from a variable is missing all of the other variable observ observations from the same case will be used from the analysis ah okay so it only deletes that one cell cases listwise deletion is if uh, there's a missing value the whole case so everything from that row is deleted we don't want that we want to use as much data as possible. You can also have a path diagram. Um, so the path diagram is going to load up here, and it's going to show us be essentially, essentially um, a uh, factor, or excuse me, a structural equation model. This is what it looks like. These are all my errors, and these are all how each of these relate to those so um this rc3 factor relates to is is suited for 12 13 14 and 15 items and then rc2 is for 7 through 11 and then rc1 is 1 through 6 and that was essentially what we had attempted to do uh we so we started with this and we got this but then of course the the we continued to noodle these items and it all changed we can also open the scree, pl scree plot here, and um, you can see where um, the eigenvalues. So here is one, and then that how many uh, how many factors load into an eigenvalue, and it looks like this one is less than one, and so that is why only when we clicked on eigenvalues above one, that's why everything loaded into only one factor because um, these other possible uh, eigenvalues don't uh, don't load up enough uh, load up enough on a factor all right so that is how you do exploratory factor analyses in jasp please leave your comments feedback down below uh, if you uh, like this video please leave a like if you are interested in more tutorial videos in JASP, Jamovi, my psych stream uh, videos on demand, please subscribe and you'll get more of that content delivered to you um, a few times a week. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.